Good morning, folks. It's Diamond with the Oppenheimer Ranch Project, Magnetic Reversal News, and Shinrin Yoku, bringing you a Grand Solar Minimum update Sunday, July 3rd, around 4 p.m. Mountain Time 2022. Did you know we are the furthest away from the sun now? But the big story, more than 12,000 flights delayed, hundreds canceled, and nobody's going anywhere. Keep calm. It's Independence Day. Thousands of flights are delayed or canceled as large corporations overbook planes because they're going bankrupt. Now, as of Saturday night, nearly 650 flights in the United States had been canceled and more than 5,200 flights within into our country had been delayed. And they blame it on lack of staff. But these flights are clearly being overbooked because they need as much money as possible. As critical fire weather conditions in Utah over the 4th of July weekend will be present Hot and windy weather for Utah on Sunday. A trough of low pressure to the northwest is aiding strong southwest winds. And take a look at this. There's rain all around Utah. We are saturated here, literally. Three inches of rain in just the last 10 days. Severe weather for portions of Montana and the Plains. Great Plains into the Midwest will warm up. Scattered severe thunderstorms are expected in Montana and the Plains today. Heavy rain may cause localized flash flooding in the Northern Plains in the Upper Midwest and Lower Mississippi Valley. Critical fire weather conditions will persist across the Great Basin and interior in Alaska into early week. Heat will build in the Plains, Ohio, Tennessee Valleys, and Great Lakes on the 4th. And then we could have some pop-up storms. So you can see here that threat of... Severe weather moving up there through Montana right there. That's going to shift east by Monday and Tuesday, so not a lot going on. But what we can show you is there is huge amounts of precipitation on the east coast, and there will be some flooding threats, especially the mountains of West Virginia and New Orleans region by mid-July. So it's going to be quite moist for the east. You could just draw a line here down the Mississippi. Everything east of the Mississippi should be getting saturated. And the big missing picture here is the big dry hole. But that eventually uh, starts to moisten up. If we could just, let me see here. I actually just went back and took a look at the last model. It was showing a little bit of moisture coming in to that region in Southern California, Nevada by mid July and the new model, well, it is dry through the end of July. Take a look at that. That is some oppressive dryness and that will be significant. So the drought in Central and Southern California and Nevada will worsen while the rest of the world, well, comes out of drought. Figure I'd pull up the most recent version of the U.S. Drought Monitor map and you can see the entire eastern region. There is no um, severe drought anything in the red or dark red. So the entire eastern portion of the U.S. is looking pretty good with a few areas in slight drought. But it is the west that is going to be crushed here. While most of this severe drought in the red here will be gone in a few weeks based on the models, this dark red area will remain. But one good thing to note is that this map, last year this time, was much darker. So there is an improvement in the U.S. as a whole. Heavy rains, floods, prompt evacuations of Sydney suburbs... Probably no drought in Sydney. As thousands are told to evacuate Sydney as heavy rains bring life-threatening emergency. Now, it is winter down there, and thousands of residents were ordered to evacuate southwest Sydney, Australia's biggest city on Sunday, with torrential rain and damaging winds pounding the east coast, and threatening floods in the area that were hammered in March. So, take a look at that. A local taking a photo of a road inundated by floodwaters in Camden, southwest in Sydney. Put another shrimp on the valley there, huh? All is quiet on the tropical cyclone front. We did have our third name storm, Colin, form off the coast of North Carolina, but that quickly fizzled out. And Bonnie made its way across Nicaragua and is now in the eastern Pacific. Let's go take a look at Bonnie. There she is. The current advisory has a 4 p.m. Maximum sustained winds at 70 miles per hour. And Tropical Storm Bonnie will potentially soon become a hurricane and basically do nothing, I think. Just go out to the west here, yeah. So it'll be a hurricane shortly and just move west. So seismic update. We did have some movement here on the New Madrid in the last 24 hours. That's now off the map. That was in a, a small quake in Missouri, probably three magnitude. We had a deadly quake in Iran 48 hours ago, five magnitude. 
but nothing else significant. Here's a 5.3 in Kyrgyzstan. So that's good news for your holiday weekend. Worldwide Volcano News Update. All is quiet across the volcano sphere. Normal activity of Sabancaya, Nevados de Ruiz, Semaru, and others. Liwotolo. All erupting at normal heights. Now, this article coming out really got me a little ticked off. Antarctica's only native insect, and you're looking at it here, could be destined for extinction as winters warm. This statement is 100% a lie. And this is coming from Nature Science Alert. There is no warming winters in Antarctica. There is no lost ice in Antarctica. Let's just break it down. This is the Admundsen Scott temperature graph for winter in degrees C. And you can see we are at the coldest winter ever in recorded history on Antarctica. Ever. There have been some warm winters, but it seems to be a biannual cycle. But you could clearly see here, 2022, the coldest winter ever. Actually, that's 2021. We don't have the winter for 2022. It's happening now. So Antarctica is getting colder. The entire graph is moving down. If I drew a line through here, Antarctica has been getting colder since the 1950s. And the coldest temperature ever recorded was last winter. The coldest before that was 1987. Here's when Al Gore won the Nobel Peace Prize, up in here. And then it quickly cooled off. Got hot and got cold. Hot and cold. That's how it works down in Antarctica. But what we're seeing here in this anomaly is anomalously cold. So no, Antarctica is not warming up. And this insect is not going anywhere. In fact, let's look at the current temperature anomaly for June 27th. The majority of Antarctica is 14 to 18 degrees below normal. And if we look at the ice extent anomaly, you can see the amount of ice is increasing since records have been kept. 2016 through 2020 were some bleak years, but where we are now, if you make a linear comparison, is higher than where we were back in 1980. That's basically all the data in Antarctica. Increasing ice, getting colder, and everything the mainstream says is the exact opposite of the truth. And that's what we want to bring to your attention there. Just like climate-related de death. You know we're all going to die because of climate change? This is the OFDA CRED International Disaster Database data for climate-related deaths from 1920 to present. And in fact, 2021 was almost impossible to graph on this chart. That's how deadly climate change is. And you can see how the danger of the climate is exponentially decreasing, not increasing like they want you to believe. These are the facts. Share them with your friends. Now, a Florida county is quarantining after the discovery of a giant invasive African land snail, and it is fantastic. Look at the size of that. The only problem is if you touch it with your skin, you can get a really creepy disease, rat lungworm. Yeah, I don't even want to know what that is. But the shells are fantastic. And this isn't the first time uh, Florida was infested with giant African land snails. It happened about 20 years ago. It took about 18 years to eradicate them in Miami-Dade. And now here they are again, a different type, equally as cute. But do not pick these guys up with your bare skin, please. Snails pose a health risk to humans because they carry a parasite called rat lungworm which can cause meningitis, and that ain't good. So stay away from the s snails or use gloves, like that researcher. Now, have you looked up late at night, maybe 9, 10 p.m., and saw something fantastic? Well, you might be looking at noctilucent clouds, and these rare clouds that glow in the dark are the most vibrant they've been in decades. Researchers say these noctilucent or night-shining clouds are the rarest, driest, and highest clouds on Earth. 
And the uptick of recent activity has been unlike anything seen in the last 15 years. And overall, since they were first discovered, they've been increasing the whole time. The presence of the clouds have been increasing in both frequency and brightness since they were first reported in 1885. Just a little background, noctilucent clouds are the highest clouds like we just said. They're from about 50 miles up and are observed slightly below the mesopause in the polar summertime. The clouds are of special interest as they are sensitive to both global climate and solar terrestrial influences, meaning space weather, like the magnetic excursion or reversal that we're experiencing now, and this shutdown of the sun. Now, the first recorded sightings, like I said, were in 1885, and both satellite and ground-based observations over the past four decades have indicated the presence of these clouds are increasing in both frequency and brightness. And scientists now realize that these clouds are very sensitive indicators for what is going on in the atmosphere at high altitudes, as small changes in the atmospheric environment can lead to large changes in the properties of these noctilucent clouds. Let's take a look at some. Just so you can get an idea what they look like. It's almost like uh, the ocean, the way they move, way up there, rippling waves or something. Now, these are being illuminated after the sun sets at a very high altitude, a few hours after it gets dark. And there's only a small window when the sun is at the correct angle that it can illuminate these ice crystals high up in the mesosphere. So, there's the background on noctilucent clouds, and we should be seeing more of them because of all the things happening on Earth. I'll leave you links to everything below. Now let's get to the distance of the sun. Can you believe it's July in, northern, in the Northern Hemisphere, it's summer, but we're actually, tomorrow, going to be the furthest away from the sun on the 4th of July. It's called aphelion, which is the opposite of perihelion, the closest. But at the furthest, or aphelion, Earth will be 94.51 million miles away from the sun. That's 152 million kilometers. Now, the reason it's warm here is because of the axis of the Earth, and the axis is tilted at about 23 degrees. And for the northern hemisphere in summer, that's when that axis points towards the sun. And so the southern hemisphere and Antarctica are pointing away from the sun, and that's what gives us the seasons. In fact, Earth will be 1.67% further from the sun than the mean Earth-Sun separation which is known as an astronomical unit. And that is 92.96 million miles. So you can see we're going to be just a few million miles further away from the sun. Now, new Ice Age data shows your dog comes from a separate ancient wolf population, according to a new study, not the ones we have today. So these wolves might have been a little nicer. Now, dogs are known to have descended from the gray wolf and thought to have been domesticated about 15,000 years ago during the Ice Age. But what remains unknown, researchers said, is where it happened and whether it occurred in one or more places. The peer-reviewed study published in Nature, let's go look at that. Researchers from the Institute said that they charted the genetic history of the gray wolf over the past 100,000 years, analyzing 72 ancient genomes from Europe, Siberia, and North America. And through the project, they have greatly increased the number of sequenced ancient wolf genomes, allowing them to create a detailed picture of wolf ancestry over time. That's fantastic. And we'll leave you links to the paper. Ice Age Wolf Genomes. Home in on the dog origins. Actually, you can't even have it. Can, you go, can we get a summary? Yeah, there we go. All right. So that will be linked below for your viewing pleasure. Now, we're going to do a little comparison about the largest star in the Milky Way and our own sun. And it's because of this paper coming out about the largest star in the Milky Way that is slowly dying. Astronomers are watching and they're going to try to calculate how long it will take to die, but that's unimportant. I want to show you that this VY Canis Majoris, the largest star in the Milky Way, potentially, versus our sun. And if VY Canis Majoris was in the position of our sun, in our solar system, 
the planets Mercury, Earth, and Mars would all be inside of it. That's how big that star is. That's a big star. <laughs> and that's a boom to big stars. Now, a new study reveals the devastating effects on astronaut bones from living in space, and in fact, concludes that you cannot live in space for extended periods of time. You'll just wither away and die a horrible death. And this is what I've been saying for six years now about the mission to Mars and all the other dumb things that humans think they're going to live off planet. Which negates, by the way, all of the fairy tales coming out from the Mars secret program and every other piece of nonsense you hear from the extraterrestrial community ever on YouTube. Complete gobbledygook. More complete gobbledygook is, well, germ theory, which we still teach and use today in modern medical science. Now, the problem with germ theory is it doesn't fix the problem because some germs get some people sick, but not others. So clearly there's something happening other than the germ. Well, it's the terrain. And your grandmother was right. You are what you eat. And the germ theory is wrong because it doesn't even address it. If you want to know more, we'll leave you this amazing expose on the entire history of terrain theory, the destruction of it by the modern pharmaceutical industry, and why those pharmaceutical multinational corporations now control governments. You want to take back your power? Well, Rio's residents in Brazil have and they're gardening their way out of hunger, which you can do too. We've been advocating it since the very first video on all of our channels. Self-sufficiency is the only way you can survive and thrive in the coming times. Don't be scared, be prepared and learn how to grow food now. And that's a boom to knowledge. Proper prior planning prevents piss poor performance in a dystopian world where I just showed you Mainstream science, the mainstream media, almost everything you know is the exact opposite of what they're telling you.